Don't get out of the car, I begged. I'm just going to go take a look, he told me. I couldn't even see the end of the line. There were about 20 more cars ahead of us and more beyond the bend. Just stay in the car. Let me go talk to somebody up there. What if you get up there and then the cars start moving again? I turned towards them. Marcus, look at me. You're not going to leave me here. He began to move towards the door. Marcus! What? You see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You don't get it. You just don't get it. What? Are you serious? I couldn't believe it. This is what I'm talking about, Marcus. I'll only be gone for a... When I agreed to go on this cross-country road trip with you, I told you... I told you, Marcus, that there will be some places where you can't leave me by myself. Didn't I tell you that? And what did you say? I wouldn't leave your side for a heartbeat or else I would die of heartache. Oh, shut the heck up. He sat back begrudgingly in his seat. Fine. Good. So, what do you think they're doing up there? I don't know, I replied. I could tell that he wanted to say something, but he opted to keep his mouth shut and began to scroll through his phone. We had talked about this before, which made it all the more frustrating. I wished that he could just get it, and at the same time I wished that he never had to feel that kind of fear. He was so carefree and laid back. I remember thinking that the first time that we met. His confidence oozed into my aura. When my friend had introduced us during lunch, and he hadn't even said a word, except for my name. Call it a gut feeling, but it has never steered me wrong. That level of self-confidence has led to physical altercations on more than one occasion, and Marcus wasn't necessarily an imposing figure. It was his attitude towards danger. The calmness in these situations that made him move differently than everyone else that was shouting and screaming. It was when we first began dating. We were at a bar and from the moment that I saw it, I knew that I shouldn't have been there. But I liked the guy so much that I still went in. I remembered stepping through the doors and mama's words were filling my ears. That boy is going to get you into trouble. I instantly felt like a shadow among the clouds. More than a pair of eyes I noticed when I walked in. It weren't only the men. It was the women too. And before I could turn around and go straight home, I see him walking towards me. He's smiling and I instantly forgot what I was so worried about. Hey, I'm glad you made it, he told me. Same. So, what are you drinking? I cleared my throat. Uh, something bottled. His head turned slightly and smiled. Okay, beer it is. My nerves were getting to me, and honestly, I haven't felt that way since I was a kid. It's the best way that I could explain it. He looked at the bartender and held up two fingers. When he turned back to look at me, from my corner cornea, I noticed the bartender give me that look. At its core, it is demeaning. Its purpose is to diminish value and it worked. I felt lesser than myself. For a second, I didn't know if I was going to be served, but the bottles were eventually plunked in front of us. So, where are you coming from? I just got out of class. Oh, right. What's your major? Biochemistry. I knew you were smart. He took a swig of his beer. So, master's, undergrad. I'm currently working on my undergrad, but I want to get my PhD. I could feel the bartender snore to my chest. It coated my throat as I swallowed. Whoa, that's crazy cool. So a doctor, huh? Yeah, I can see it. The bartender snorted again, and then spit in the sink as he wiped a glass. And for the first time that night, I think Marcus realized what was going on. He kept talking to me, but kept an eye on the man behind the counter. It must be tough, you know, a lot of studying. I nodded. Yeah, so what do you do? Tammy told me that you worked as a consultant. For the government? No, it's nothing that important, he said. I fulfill contracts. Military contracts. 
he takes another drink. No, nothing of that sort. Not really. Mostly pen caps and um, stationary supplies. Pen caps, what does that even mean? He finished his beer and told me, Hey, I'm going to the restroom. I'll be right back. And before I could object, Marcus had gotten out of his seat and was walking towards the end of the hall. Come back. I wanted to say to him, but he was already too far away and the sinking feeling that had disappeared earlier, it had started crawling back. To this day, I don't know exactly what happened. Two guys that were at the bar had approached me. The hairs on my neck knew that they weren't friendly. I wish I could have said that. I told them to screw off, but I didn't. I knew that even if I had tried to leave then, they wouldn't have let me go. So I sat there and tried not to anger them. I tried to be hollow, except they weren't having it. And that was when I knew that it didn't matter what I tried. I could have played that same moment in time with a million more lives and nothing would have changed in their minds. They were determined to hurt me. Drown a blend in, is what one of the men said. Couldn't fool me, said the other. Why don't you two sit back down? I heard Marcus say from the blue. They turned around. One of them grabbed his collar. Marcus broke his arm. The other guy punched in nothing but air and then found himself face flat on the counter. The bartender drew his gun and pointed it at Marcus. Get the heck out of my bar, the bartender roared. I was shaken as Marcus led me by the elbow. Some people stood up as we walked past. Marcus swung the door open and we stepped outside, greeted by the familiar surroundings of downtown. Cars hummed along. Couples were taking a 90 stroll at the Cesar Chavez Park, and the summer air touched my skin. The smell of popcorn nearby with the sounds of laughter almost made me throw up. It felt surreal. As if I had stepped out of one plane of existence and into another, only a doorstep away. It says online that this area is prone to rock slides, Marcus told me, snapping me out of my memory and back into the car. And it's a one lane road, he grumbled. We might be stuck here for a while. A couple of cars in front of us was a blue SUV. The door opens and a man steps out. I can tell that he's tall as his shoulder hovered above the roof of the vehicle. He slams the door and starts making his way down the line. I'll ask that guy what's going on when he gets back, Marcus told me. That sounds like a good idea, I said. Minutes pass as we sat in silence, only for the air to be broken by the sounds of a couple behind us stretching out their legs. What do you think is going on? The man asked the woman. Oh, it's probably that ledge I told you about last month, the woman replied. Oh, right, the netting. It looked loose, huh? God, we're going to be here all day at this rate, the woman complained. Several cars in front of us, another car door opens. A woman gets out and runs to the woods immediately to her left. She disappears from view. Well, everyone knows who's going to take a piss. Marcus laughed. I couldn't help but smile. I'm <laughs> glad it's not me. I went before we left the hotel. He pulled up his phone, the coordinates and the GPS blared on the screen. Look, we're only 22 miles away, can you believe it? It's almost around this bend down the mountain. Some inner roads and bam, we're here. I could almost jog there, he complained. I'm sure they'll clear up the road soon enough. It's likely that they only have one part of the road cleared, he groaned. They might even let the other cars go first, and who knows how many cars are waiting on the other side. I see a work truck rumbling by. It looks like they might be done soon. I hope so. Then another truck... Then another. Hey, aren't they driving a little fast? I asked. Another truck roared past us. I could still see the dust that it had kicked up. Yeah, a bit. Marcus replied slowly. Oh crap, they're gonna hit that girl. Marcus laid his palm on the horn. I turned to look at what he was talking about. The girl who had gone to the bathroom was coming back from the woods and a tow truck and nearly took her out. 
and missed her by a fender. Before she could gather herself, another truck came tumbling out of the corner. The driver sees the girl in the last second and careens off the road, hitting a tree before it comes to a dead stop. Smoke is coming out of the hood and I can see the man's head slumped against the steering wheel. He's pressed against the horn and it's blaring. Oh my god, are they alright? I don't know, it looks bad, Marcus told me. We see someone ahead and get out of the vehicle, and they run towards the crash. I'm glad that someone else decided to help them and not Marcus. What the heck is he doing? Marcus has suddenly asked. Where is that guy going? The man that I thought was going towards the crash had instead completely passed out. He is running into the woods, Marcus exclaimed. What's going on? I asked. Marcus reached for the door handle again. I'm going to lend a hand. No, Marcus, please. What are you talking about? Listen, someone has to go check up on that guy in the truck. I grabbed his arm. He wrings himself from my grasp. Call 911, he told me. That guy is going to need an ambulance. He slams the door behind him and locks it. The car beeps. My hands are shaking as I fiddle with my phone. I'm trying to call 911 when I start to hear people screaming. I look up and see people getting out of their cars. They're running towards me. I look towards the woods, trying to find Marcus at the crash site, but I can't find him. There are so many people running away. Men, women, children. Entire families had abandoned their vehicles and were running back down the mountain. The car alarm blares as someone runs face first into the hood. I could feel their body thud against the steel. I open the door. Marcus! I make my way towards the front of the car. The young girl was bleeding from her head. Marcus! I screamed as I grabbed the girl from her arm. Can you stand? She shrugs her shoulders. I put most of her weight on me as I help her up. Marcus! There's so many people running out in front of me that I can't see anything but the top of the trees in the distance. There's luggage and shoes on the floor. An ice chest. I see a doll being trampled by the endless footprints stampeding past me. Mark! He suddenly appears at my side and immediately grabs the girl from me and tosses her onto the floor. Marcus, what the heck? I turned angrily towards him. I almost didn't recognize the man standing in front of me. The look on his face, it was one of pure terror. His eyes are wide and his mouth is slacked open. The color is drained from his skin and everything looks sunken into his face. He grabs me by the arm and starts to drag me into the crowd. His grip on my forearm feels as if it'll crush my bones. Marcus, what's going on? Where are we going? I yelled. A big man running towards me, crosses his arms and completely bulldozes me flat. My head hits the pavement. I can't hear. My body doesn't even feel the people stepping on me as they run past. I try to breathe, but the air gets stuck in my throat and all I can do is choke. I'm trying to stand, pulling on anything in my grasp. Someone tumbles as I reach out. I feel as if I'm about to be drowned by a sea of bodies. I can't breathe. I claw away at their limbs, their skin, and clothes, trying to get my head above the patch of blue overhead. I claw my way through the barrage of human bodies, digging my fingers into the endless torrent until finally my head swims above the surface and I take my first breath. It hurts the moment that I breathe. I fill my lungs again before the sea of people crash over me again, pulling me back beneath the waves, and then up again as my body is being thrashed. As my head appeared above the waves, I get a glimpse of the bodies being mowed down ahead, the headlights beaming towards us as someone is driving their vehicle on on the other side. They're running people over, I told myself, and I am in the way. It's going to crush me. I whispered as the swarm swallows me again. I feel a familiar grip on my arms. The wing in my forearm feels crushed beneath its grip. It digs into the space between my bones, squeezing the sinew as it drags me out. Marcus, 
I screamed. The crowd keeps pushing us further down the road until we reach the turnout that is facing the forest. Marcus! We've got to go, now! He pulls me roughly from the loop of my pants. I nearly fall over again from the forest. Marcus drags us past the crashed vehicle and starts running towards the trees. I can hear a helicopter above us, its rotors thwacking the air as it splits the sky open. Marcus, what the heck is going on? But he keeps running. My feet chase after him, scraping along the forest floor, being ragdolled by the trees as I slam into them in my pursuit. My eyes are glued into his back as we come to an open field. My fingers wrap themselves tightly around his shirt when I catch up. My chest is heaving and my hand is on my knee. My lungs are on fire as I gasp for air. If I weren't so tired, I would have noticed immediately that something is wrong. Marcus was rigid beside me, colder than stone. When I finally looked up, I realized that we weren't in an open field at all. Every tree in sight was bent at the base of their trunk. They weren't snapped in half or laying on the floor. They were bent over. It was like a sea of trees had been swept flat. I can't believe they brought it here. Marcus suddenly spoke. A million thoughts raced through my head. You know what this is? The same look earlier still etched into his face. Uh, I never thought they would bring it here. What's here? What are you talking about? There's no time. We have to keep running. He pulls me through the field of bent trees until the mountain shoots straight up into the sky again. We have to climb. I look up. It's a sheer cliff. I feel like a bug looking up the side of a cupboard, except I don't have any claws or wings. I can't stick myself to the edge. I shake my head. No, no way. I can't do that. Marcus pulls me towards him with both of his hands. You're hurting me. He doesn't lose in his grip. If we don't climb, now it's over. It's going to come and get us. And there will be nothing that we can do. Nothing. Do you understand me? There will be nothing. No one, anyone, anywhere on this planet could do. It'll all be over. The look in his eyes told me that he believed this with every fiber of his being. I nodded and felt his grip loosen around my arms. I'm going to help you up first. You keep climbing. I'll help you when I can. If you get stuck, I'll call out directions. If you fall, I will catch you. If I fall, don't stop. Keep climbing. Do not look back down. Find a safe place to hide. Do you understand? I nodded again. Marcus looks up and points. You see that path? He traces the mountain with his finger. It looks steep, but there are a lot of places to hold on to. He waves his hand across a section above. There. We'll have to move to the left. The rock formation indicates that a natural opening could be nearby. Maybe even a cave system that leads deeper into the mountain. If we hide there until morning, we might have a chance. He starts to push me up the wall. I had never climbed anything except the kitchen counter to get something off the top shelf. I was terrified to say the least. But somehow, my hands found one ledge after another. Push up with your legs. It'll take the stress off your shoulders and fingers. I hear him yell from below me. Grab, push, grab, push, grab. My arms swing wildly as a rock comes loose in my hands. For a moment, I am hanging in midair and all I can think about is, Oh, this is how Wily Coyote does it. Except for Marcus, it wouldn't let me fall. I feel this palm on my lower back and I'm pushed flat against the rock wall again. I hit the mountain hard. There are blinks of white lights in my vision, but somehow I manage to hold on. My fingers are bleeding, but I've got a good grip. A part of me wanted to stay there and never move again. Perhaps I would blend in. No one would be expecting to look halfway up some random mountain for people dangling there, right? My thoughts are swarming when I hear it. I know it's a sound that I will never forget. My body stiffens and I want to be a rock so badly. It sounds like wood popping in the fireplace. Pieces of sap that are trapped, which burst from the intense heat. The only difference being it wasn't a piece of wood. 
Nor was it only one tree. It was an entire forest being crushed. The sounds of each log hitting the ground at the same time shook the mountain. Pieces of rock began to fall around and above me. I turned my head to look below. My eyes barely above the tree line and the giant trunks fall by the hundreds. It was coming for us. Move, 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 move! Marcus yells from below. I feel his hands urging me to climb, but my knees feel like jelly. He jams his fingers hard into my butt. The shock wakes me up. The pain splinters my thoughts and I can feel my eyes start to water. Move! He shouts at me like a drill sergeant. Pick up your legs and go! Now, now, now! I bend my knee and push myself upward. I can still feel his jab every time I push on. My hands are scrambling. My mind just keeps telling me to grab and push, to keep this motion until my hands find nothing but air. I start to panic. It was grab and push, grab and push, but they had changed it on me. I look down but Marcus hasn't noticed yet, and then it hits me. Left. This must be where I start pushing left. I look to the left and see more handholds. The technique was different, but it was easy to fall into a routine as I made my way left and up. When I had run out of holds, I found myself climbing onto a flat part of the mountain. I scrambled onto the ledge and my body dropped to the floor like a sack of rocks. I had never been this exhausted before. My arms and legs were screaming, and each breath felt as if they were taken in front of a lighter, pressed close to my mouth. I turned to look out at the forest below. Get up! Marcus grabs me from my armpits and hoists me back onto my feet. We have to keep moving. There, look. He points up ahead, but my eyes are so tired that when I turn them, I can feel them sticking in their sockets. He drags me most of the way. I can feel him slowing down beneath me, so I force my legs to stand, to take the weight off of him. I look up and finally see what he was pointing at. It was the shape of a mouth, protruding out of the bones of the mountain. A cave. Marcus pushes me up an uneven patch and I step into the shadows. I can smell the damp walls and it's much cooler in here. I see steam coming off my skin as it's cooling down. I turn around to the entrance of the cave and see Marcus's silhouette in the light. I can see him breathing a sigh of relief as he starts to walk in. Every step seems so slow. Every breath feels so heavy. Everything, except the long arm that presses itself against the cave entrance. It was the size of an elephant trunk. It pressed itself flat against the rock as if searching, feeling, feeling its way blindly in the dark until it senses Marcus. The antenna-like appendage snaps out and thrusts itself into his back. There's no look of surprise. It was too fast. It snatched Marcus off his feet and snaps out of the cave. In less than a second, he was gone, and I'm left standing there alone. My brain still trying to process what had happened. Was it even real? I reached my hand out to where he could have been standing. Come back. I don't know how many hours I stood there, looking out from the cave. I know that I watched as the sun went down. The shades of orange and red turned into blue as black as night. The entire time waiting for something to happen. For Marcus to come back. Or that thing to come and take me too. Except nothing happened. And when daylight broke, I finally stepped outside. I looked up at the mountain where the tentacle had pressed itself against the rocks and noticed that it left the lip of the cave completely flat, as if somebody had sliced the rock with a sharp blade and then polished it. Somehow, my feet and arms found a way down the mountain. I crossed the field of bent trees, found my way through the narrow forest and eventually came back to the main road. Holy crap! It was the voice from a young man, an officer. He couldn't have been more than 20. He ran towards me as I exited the woods. Uh, we found another one. He grabs me close and puts his brown jacket around me. You're okay now, you're safe. He keeps on repeating. But in my head, all I could think about was, 
There are survivors. The red lights of the ambulance flash as I'm soon transported off the mountain. We're taking you to Mercy. It's right at the foot. That's where most people were transported to. The EMT puts her hand on my shoulder. Is there anyone that I can help you find? When we arrived at the hospital, some doctors and nurses checked me out. The EMT stopped by and sadly reported that Marcus wasn't on the list. He might be at one of the other hospitals, she said. Some were flown off by helicopters. I was taken to a room with about 20 beds. When I had fallen asleep, they were all filled. When I woke up, they were empty, and two men in navy blue suits came in. One of them stood by the door while the other pulled up a chair and sat next to me. I'm terribly sorry about your entire ordeal. How are you feeling? I squinted slightly and shrugged. I I'm alright. What's good to hear? You need anything? A coffee, perhaps? I'd like something a bit stronger. I smiled. He smiled back. Wouldn't we all? He turned to look at his partner. Get her something nice afterwards, okay? The other man nodded. So, he turns to look at me. My name is Sam. I'm an intelligence officer for the DIA. I shake my head. Who? We're the Defense Intelligence Agency. We report directly on foreign anomalies. He pulls out a badge and he shows it to me. I'm required to take eyewitness testimony of the events that had unfolded. I know it's terrible timing, but the more information we have, perhaps the more people in need we could find. He pauses and pulls out a notepad from inside his jacket lining. It says here that you were traveling with a companion. I nodded. Marcus, my boyfriend. Do you know where he is currently? I shake my head. No, we got separated. When? I was in the car and Marcus had gotten out to help one of the workers who had crashed into a tree. He told me to stay put and lock the door. Then what happened? I'm not sure. People started running and screaming. There was a young lady who ran into my car and I tried to help her. But by the time I got there, she was already running again. Do you know what happened to her? Did she make it? What did she look like? At 21, 22 perhaps. Had a shoulder length brown hair. A tattoo on her neck. I think it was a butterfly. I could hear Marcus in my head. Good, good. Establish yourself as a reliable witness with details. I'll look into it, Sam replied. He wrote something down on his notepad. I shook my head. I should have stayed in the car, shouldn't I have, Sam? His partner said to me, Rushing to someone's aid. That's a hero in my book. Sam nodded. It's often difficult to react. Even the most trained people hesitate. He turns to look at me. What happened after you stepped out of the vehicle? I got lost, mostly in the crowd. I looked up at him. There were so many people, I don't even know where they were coming from. It was chaos. I've never been so scared of being trampled in my life. And I've been to football games in Oakland. Sam kept nodding. After you left the vehicle, when did you meet up with Marcus? I didn't. We never found each other. I got tossed around by the Masha people and found myself running away. Everyone was trying to get off the mountain, but I couldn't get back into that crowd again. Where did you go? I ran through the field where they were logging or something. Tons of trees were cut down. There was nowhere for me to hide, so I just kept running. Until I found a cave. I ran inside and waited until morning. Sam continued nodding. And at any time did you see anything else? Something abnormal? A person, perhaps? Or an event that could help us locate a missing, you know? I shook my head. I was so scared, you know. Good, Marcus cooed. Use his own words. I was just so grateful that they rescued me. Sam closed his notebook. I'm glad we were able to find you. He stood up. Someone from the police department will be here shortly to get an official statement. 
Rest well and I hope to have more information for you soon. Be in touch. The pair left my room. Later, the doctor would come by and clear me for discharge and the officer that had come in to take my statement led me to a group waiting in the lobby. The county is putting everyone up until this mess is cleared. They've rented a place nearby where most of you will be staying. The officer told me, maybe they'll find your boyfriend while we're waiting. They all looked banged up. Is this everyone? One of the women asked. She was tall, about 5'10". Where are all of the others? Yeah, there were some 40 or 50 people that came in with us. Where is everyone? Asked a shorter woman wearing red. Well, I'm not sure, the officer told us. It could be that some of them needed some more attention than previously thought or they were flown out to hospitals that were better equipped. So it's just the four of us? Asked the woman in red. Well, five, the officer corrected her. He tilted his head towards a corner bench where a man was sitting down with his hands in his face. I heard he lost his wife and daughter. Came a soft voice. I think they were being pushed by that crazy mob, and they fell off the side of the mountain. One of the other women said. She looked at me. Hi, I'm Irene. She turned to the tall woman and said. That's Jill, and the lady in red is Guadalupe. Hi, I'm... Your transportation will be here in about 15 minutes. Please gather up your things and be ready by the front door. The officer told everyone. If you need anything, please do not hesitate to ask. He finished by walking over to the man in the corner. The officer knelt before him. I couldn't hear what was being said. Four women and a man. Joe came from behind. Staying together. Why didn't they just put us up in a hotel or something? Uh, maybe there wasn't any rooms available, Irene said. We are sort of in the middle of nowhere. Oh, come on. You're acting as if you've never lived in a coa before, Guadalupe said. Jill shook her head. No, I went to an all-girls Catholic school, and an all-girls after. Guadalupe rolled her eyes. I'm Mexican. My entire family is made up of Catholics, and we know to be nice to thy neighbor. Jill shrugged. I was just saying... So, did anyone see what was going on? Irene asked. No, I just saw a bunch of white people running and I knew it wasn't going to be anything good. Joe replied. Guadalupe laughed. Aren't you white? Yeah, and I was out running. What are you talking about? Joe smiled. They turned to look at me. And did you see anything? I shook my head. I didn't see anything at all. The state trooper opened the door and let us in. Everything we paid for by the county. He went ahead to check the rooms as our gangly group ground to a halt at the entrance landing. The kitchen is on the second floor, he called out. Some volunteers had stocked the place. You're all welcome to anything that is here. I've never seen a kitchen on the second floor, Joe replied. We're in the mountains, and most everyone has one. It's a great place to entertain and quite the captivating view, I told her. She seemed surprised. I worked as a realtor for six years. That explains everything, and Guadalupe replied. It was my turn to be surprised. Staunch shoulders, she said. You were born with natural shoulder pads uh, for suits. Only Irene chuckled. Oh, come on, ladies. Oh, and Robert. Can't forget about Robert. I don't believe anyone forgot about Robert. I could hear him crying in the back of the SUV the entire time. I felt for him, really, I did. But everyone in that car had lost us yesterday. Everyone had a reason to cry. Let's get up these stairs. Irene slowly started the ascent. It seemed to me as if her right leg was troubled. Irene was the oldest one of the five of us. I wanted to help her up, but the idea of lifting my legs up any more steps made me wince. I couldn't bear it. I started to head deeper into the first floor. Hey, where are you going? Jill asked. She loomed in the hallway. She was about 5'10", perhaps 5'11", now that I took a look at her. For some reason, 
I've always felt that a woman at those heights was always a larger built than a man of the same. She was towering, her size intimidating. I pushed past her, finding a room. I walked down the long hallway and into a second living room. A small flat screen TV was hooked to an old PlayStation console. There were four doors on the left. I tried the first door. It was a broom closet, some buckets and cleaning supplies, a toiletries, and a cheap plaque guaranteeing the cleanliness of each unit. It must be an investment property for someone, and they hired a third party to maintain their rental. I tried the next day and found a children's room, 8 by 10 if I had to guess. There were two single beds on either side of the wall and an empty closet. I looked out at the only window in the room, and it faced at the fence, typical of a kid's room. I pulled down the blinds and pointed them upwards. I learned that if they were pointing down, someone outside could look in. It's an old realtor trick to keep the house as discreet as possible, to bring more appointments to the listing. But for tonight, it would serve as a freebie barrier to the outside world as I slept. I threw my luggage on one of the beds and I locked the door behind me. Mirrored bifold doors hung on the closet. I took a gander at myself for the first time in what seemed like weeks. My hair had begun to curl as the products wore off. The trace amounts of eyeliner and foundation were gone, leaving a pallid texture behind. The clothes I wore draped across my frame were donations from the hospital staff as mine had become tatters. I eased myself closer to the mirrors as I slid off my jeans. The action alone made my elbow shake. I managed to pull it beneath my thigh as I looked at it in the mirror. The wound is still oozed with blood. I could smell the stench now as it was laid open to the air. It hurt with every step that I took. The doctor said that it required four stitches to keep from splitting to my vaginal opening. You won't be able to hold in your bowel movements for some time. You'll need to wear incontinence pads until you've healed. The doctor told me at the hospital. You said you fell on something. The truth kept playing in my head. If only I hadn't stopped moving. If only I didn't hesitate for that second when we were climbing. Perhaps Marcus wouldn't have been taken. A fraction of a second could have possibly changed everything. A loud knock on the door made me jump. The pus from my wound bled through the padding. Still, I pulled up my pants. What? I called out. Hey, it's Jill. The rest of us decided that Irene would have the master bedroom on the second floor, as it's closest to the kitchen and the living and dining, she explained. That way, she doesn't have to keep climbing the stairs. You good with that? Yeah, it sounds like a great idea. Okay, if you're hungry, they're making food upstairs. I'll be right up. There is a pause. And we found something. Don't know if you... Is it about the other survivors? No, nothing like that. It's just, well, come upstairs. They're making a big deal out of it, but maybe you could shed some light on it. I opened the door. What's going on? They found a locked door upstairs. Jill began to lead the way up. When we came to the stairs, I gritted my teeth and followed her. I told them that it's nothing, but honestly, I've never seen it before at any Airbnb that I've rented. She turned to me. Um, but you're a realtor, right? I thought you could maybe tell us a bit about it. And when we made it to the top of the stairs, the kitchen opened up to our view. Robert, Irene, and Guadalupe were standing around the counter. Various plates of food were in shallow bowls. Where's the trooper? Irene handed me a plastic plate. There's some snacks on the table. The trooper already laughed. Said something about being needed back at the hospital. Guadalupe told me. Fancy place, ain't it? She motioned to these solid wood beams and high ceilings. They even have a Thor. I always see them in fancy homes. Joe said there's a locked room. Oh, yeah, in Irene's room, right next to her bed. Guadalupe popped a grape into her mouth. Creepy if you ask me. Can someone show it to me? Uh, sure, 
I said. She got up and led me down the hall to the right. The master bedroom opened up to a sitting area with a king-sized bed at the end. She walked over to the door closest to her side of the bed. She jiggled the handle. Just a locked door, she told me. The other three were behind me, crowding the walkway. I went out of her look at the handle. Uh, medico, I said aloud. It's an expensive lock, nearly custom. You have to show your ID and register for it. They're nearly impossible to pick. Why would you need to show an ID to purchase a door lock? Robert asked. They could be afraid of it being used for locking someone in against their will, Guadalupe said. If it can't be picked or whatever, now let me take a crack at it. Jill scarfed down the remainder of her toast and pulled out a needle that was hidden in her sleeve. Do you always have that? I asked. Never leave home without them, she smiled. After several minutes of watching her try to pick the lock, the girl finally gave up. It's not going to budge. I've seen my fair share of locks broken to them too, but this one is solid. Anyone else notice a similar lock in the house somewhere else? I asked. This caused a great shuffling. Not a word was spread amongst us as we scoured the house. When we regrouped in the kitchen, it was Robert who spoke. There's one downstairs in the garage. Same lock. I tried the handle and it wasn't going anywhere. It could be a broom closet, Irene asked. If it is, then there would be three broom closets in this house. I saw one downstairs near the rooms, but it was unlocked, I told them. This place is big, but I'm certain that the locked door in Irene's room is one of the walk-in closets for the master bedroom. Uh, you think the owners have their stuff in there? Robert asked. That way, they don't have to pack as much when they come here themselves. Yeah, that could be it. Or someone is hiding inside and they're waiting for us to go to sleep. Guadalupe chuckled. It's not funny, Jill said. It's not uncommon for empty houses to have squatters, stragglers, or frogging. I told them. I met a few cases myself. What's frogging? Irene asked. People secretly living in homes, hiding in other rooms or closets or in an attic. Guadalupe said quietly. What? It was all over the news a couple of years ago. There was a guy, right, who got a divorce and his wife and kids moved out of their big house. And no one was aware that they had an uninvited guest the entire time. Yeah, I heard about that. Robert spoke up. How no one knew still blows my mind. Guadalupe nodded. The husband didn't even notice until one day when he ran out of creamer for his coffee. So, he gets the milk from the fridge. It's a brand new one, so he pops it off and pours some in. He does this for several days as he hadn't had time to run to the store. But he started to notice that the milk was disappearing faster than he was using it. He didn't want to admit it, but something felt wrong. Eventually, his uneasiness causes him to set up security cameras all over his house. She turns to look at Robert. At first, he monitors it every hour, but after a few days, the novelty of spying on his empty house grows dull. So after about a week, he promptly forgets all about it and goes back to his busy work schedule. Then one day when he's sitting on the toilet, he finds ribbons of notifications on his phone. They seem endless. He clicks through them and sees that it's from the security app that came with the cameras. He hasn't checked them out in a while and they've been piling up. Still, it seemed more than a single man in a house could make so. He starts looking through them. It's mostly blue and green images of his house and him walking around. You'd mostly find videos of me walking around naked. Joe tried to joke. I'm walking around the house. But in one video, he notices something out of place. There's a movement in one of the kitchen cupboards. So he thumbs through it. The door swings open. And out splits a contorted mess of crumpled limbs. It begins to unfold itself on the tiled floor. Even in the low quality footage, the man could see the joints popping back into place. Crick crack. Crick crack goes the bones on the screen. And as the neck turns around, he realizes that it's a woman behind the stunted form. She's in a blue gown with her hair down to her knees. 
She walks over to the fridge and opens it up, grabs the milk and pops off the lid. She puts her lips on the plastic and begins to drink. Irene put her coffee cup down on the counter, Jill is shaking her head, and didn't even brush her teeth. Guadalupe continues. The man frantically scrolls through the videos, and he starts to see the woman everywhere, sometimes even when he's sleeping. She stands outside of his door for hours and just waits, and there are many times when he's missed her by a hair, such as when he's rushing out the door, whether it be getting his jacket on or trying to find his work bag. She's standing from the corners of his cornea just out of sight. The notifications keep popping up as he scrolls. My eyes search the cupboards lining the tops of the kitchen, looking for anything out of place. Guadalupe looks at Irene. Finally, the man reaches a video that is playing with the date is current. It shows him coming home that day, of him getting a drink in the kitchen. Another video capture of him going up the stairs. He throws his bag onto the bed. And then the camera in the bathroom records him opening the door to the toilet where he sat now. And then it cuts to a video on the stairs. The woman is walking up them. The man couldn't believe it. This intruder was in his house right now. He started pulling up his pants to catch her in the act. There's a fury in his eyes and the toilet paper rolls onto the floor as he angrily snatches at them. But then another notification comes up. He looks down at it slowly and with a trembling finger he presses play. It shows the woman standing right outside of the door. Guadalupe's voice lowers and I lean forward to listen. Neighbors hear screaming and shouting. The police were eventually called and when the officer on site opened the door to the bathroom, the walls were smeared in crap and the man is sitting there dead. And on the wall is written, Coexistence. And we all stood there in silence around the island in the kitchen when Joe finally spoke. Crap, no wonder I get creeped out whenever I see those bumper stickers while I'm driving. And Guadalupe smiled tiredly. Yeah, yeah, that was the point of the story. And we finished pieces of dinner in the Connor and spoke briefly about our experiences on the mountain. And when I finally got back into my room, I could barely keep my eyes closed. They kept darting to the door. Nearly an hour goes by and I'm staring at the ceiling when I hear a soft knock. Hey, it's me. I recognize the voice as a Guadalupe's. Yeah, come in, I told her. She opens the door up slowly in her hand is a bottle. Degreaser, she says. I found it under one of the sinks. I'm going around and hitting all the hinges with it. It'll make them squeak when they're opened. I smiled. Where did you ever learn that? You know, here or there. Also, Jill is putting up Christmas wreaths in the locked doors. There's little bells on them. She come up with that on her own? I asked. No, it was Irene's idea. Guadalupe sat on the opposite bed. So, what do you think about everyone? She asked. Some of the things they said about the mountain were pretty wild. Yeah, I just can't believe people really ran Robert's daughter and wife off the mountain. The way that he was telling it after dinner, it's just awful. What about you, huh? You see anything unusual? She questioned. I shook my head. Um, I mostly hid for that entire night. I was hoping that someone would find me, but mostly I hid because it was cold. Good, good, Marcus's voice said. Don't draw masculine attention to yourself. Right, same. I hold up next to a partially hollowed out tree. She's lying. You were in the tree line? You saw those trees. She nodded. Yeah, really scary out there at night. She patted the bed. I uh, hope you get some sleep. The door squealed as she pulled it shut. When morning came, I changed my bandage, pulling off the old one and scraping the leaking fluids into a trash bag. I wiped myself clean and administered the ointment and placed a new bandage in its place before going back upstairs. I had taken a handful of painkillers, but climbing didn't get any easier. The sun poured into the kitchen magnificently and Irene was there to greet me with a cup of coffee. 
She pulled open the fridge and dangled the jug in her hand. Milk? I groaned. Too soon, she laughed. I turned around with the warm cup in my hands and looked out the window. The mountain range filled every square in the frame. The tops were littered with snow and freshly minted flakes were falling from the sky. It's beautiful. Irene breathed. I wish my husband could have seen it. We were only a few hours away from our campsite. She smiled and looked at me. It's where we met, you know. 43 years ago. When I still had a good leg. She takes a sip of her coffee. I was with a bunch of girlfriends from college and we were on summer break. Him and his buddies came riding over on their motorcycles. She pulled up a picture on her phone. It was a snapshot of a Polaroid. He was so handsome, she said. Well, she finished quietly. At least it's a beautiful day. And I looked out the window. When do you think snow goes from beautiful to terrifying? I asked her. The snowstorm raged outside. In a few hours, it had grown from a gentle breeze into a hellish pelting that shook the house painfully. The front door rattled as each gust of wind threatened to throw it open. The snow piled on the roads and the sun had been blotched from the sky. It was midday but as dark as night. I could hear the wind screaming as it tore past the cabin, scratching its nails against the wood, itching to pull it all down. At this rate, we'll be buried, Robert said. I thought it was global warming, Irene commented. It's nearly April. I could see Jill biting her tongue, but in the end, she chose not to say anything. By the time Guadalupe joined us, the boiler had stopped working. What's going on? The water is freezing, she told us as she came up the stairs. I think the gas main is out. I told her. Power surging too, Joe pointed outside. Probably interference with the lines. Hey, has anybody got his cell phone connection? Robert could be heard. I watched from the window as the thick power cables bounced outside. Why is it moving like that? It's bouncing up and down, up and down as if being strummed violently. They look as if they're about to snap off. Ice build up at the edges, which causes the air to move around them weird. Looks like little invisible men are jumping on them. Yeah, Jill said. I shot her a look. What? I worked as a pole technician for a couple of years. One night began to settle, we each silently came to the conclusion that no one was going to be coming for us tonight. Robert had found some candles and set them around the kitchen. Guadalupe built a fire in the living room. I gathered blankets from the closets and brought them up, as Joe filled the sinks and tubs with water. Maybe we should all huddle up in here. I dropped the blankets in my arms. It's the only warm place left in the house. I don't mind sleeping in my room, Joe said. Do you think that's the best? Irene asked. I'll come back up if it gets too cold, she told us before heading to her room. Anyone able to get a hold of the trooper or the hospital? Guadalupe stoked the fire. I could feel the heat coming as she stroked the coals. I hadn't realized that my bones were aching until then. I still don't have a connection, Irene said. Robert pulled out a crumpled yellow jacket from his bag. I'll be in my room, as he too left. Irene, Guadalupe, and I would split up the sectional in front of the fireplace. I don't know when I had fallen asleep, but even in my dreams, I'd hear the crackling of the wood in the hearth. They reminded me of the trees in the forest, flattening in front of me as I hung on the mountainside. I could hear Marcus clawing his way below me. Don't look down, he kept repeating. But it was the thing in the distance that scared me. I could see it from up here against the mountain. It was completely flat and the size of a football field. Its white underbelly contrasted by the pink rubbery flesh on its back, and the many tentacles flicking at the trees like a serpent's tongue as it moved across the land, searching for a hole. It looked like a giant tapeworm, spewing foam from the crooked teeth and closing its mouth. 
I remember thinking, it can't see me, can't possibly know that I'm here, it has no eyes. But then it turned to look at me and I swear that it didn't need them. I screamed as I woke up. I was covered in sweat. I had stopped screaming but the wailing continued to fill my mouth. It was because Guadalupe was screaming too. Oh god no! She kept screaming. Who did this? Which one of you did this? I turned to see Robert coming up the stairs and Jill standing frozen in the kitchen. In Guadalupe's blood covered arms was Irene's body. Her throat cut from ear to ear. We have to call the police, I told them. Which one of you did it? Guadalupe yelled. Was it you? She rounded on Robert. I was downstairs in my room sleeping when I heard you screaming, he told her. And why would it automatically be me? You two were the ones sleeping closest to her. Guadalupe lunged at him, but Jill came between them. Stop, she yelled. He did it, Guadalupe said. I know that he did it. What are you talking about? Robert spat. I didn't do anything. I, I saw you, she yelled. On the mountain, I saw you. What? Jill and I turned to look at him. You pushed your wife and kids off the mountain. I saw you. What are you talking about? Your wife, she has blonde hair, right? And your little girl, she was wearing a pink dress with white strawberries. Guadalupe turned to us. I saw them when I was running, but I didn't recognize him until I saw that jacket that he put on. Guadalupe pointed a long, accosting finger at him. You had your hood down, and you were wearing that mustard-colored jacket when you stood next to them. I saw you push them off the cliff. She was gasping now. At the time, I was thinking, how could anyone do something so horrible? Come to find out that it's so much worse. It was their own family. You did it and I saw you. You don't know what you're talking about. Robert began quietly. I didn't kill my family. I could see his lip quivering. I didn't. They were coming so fast. The people started pushing us. Melissa was crying and my wife couldn't get her to shut the heck up. I was holding on to them but people just kept piling into us. Shut up. Guadalupe's tone was flat. Stop lying. She had gone into the kitchen and pulled one of the knives from the drawers. I saw you push them off. But I was slipping. So you push your wife and kids off the mountainside to save your own butt. Oh yeah, a real man. Guadalupe circled around the counters, the glint of the blade in her hand. Everyone was scared, Jill began. She had her hands out. Come on, Guadalupe, you were probably too far away to see what actually happened. Guadalupe raised the knife and pointed it at Robert. Something rolled off the tip and landed on the carpet. She looked down at the knife and dropped it when she realized it was covered in blood. Jill reached to confiscate the knife, but Robert shouted, Don't! There could be fingerprints on it! Jill looked at him for a second, and then slowly backed off as Robert rounded on Guadalupe, covering your tracks. What? She replied warily. You're developing an alibi on how your fingerprints got on the murder weapon, he mocked. You even planned for witnesses, he hissed. Why wouldn't I just wipe the blade down and put it away if I were the killer, you dummy? I don't know what kind of twisted thoughts are going up in your head. It wasn't me, Guadalupe shouted. Don't try and pin this on me. Just think about the chances that you open some random drawer and pull out the murder weapon, Robert scoffed. That's some BS and you know it. Except this time, he wasn't speaking to Guadalupe. He was directing it at us. I think that it's better if the two of you stay in Irene's room, Joe began. I'm not staying in a room with that killer, Guadalupe yelled. It was him, I'm telling you. The two of you are going to regret this, she laughed. He's going to kill everyone. Will you shut the heck up, Robert shouted. I haven't killed anyone. How can you stand there on top of their desk with a clean conscience, sitting here denying it as if I and God didn't see you push them off? You coward. Robert struck her against the face, his fist closed as it connected. I watched as her head was thrown backwards from her shoulder as she collapsed onto the kitchen counter. Before I could react, Jill was on top of him. 
She had a leg wrapped around his midsection and her arms twisted around his neck. He slammed their bodies against the fridge. The cabinet shuddered and creaked as their doors rocked on its hinges. But Jill's grip never loosened. Not until Robert's eyes rolled back into his head, causing the two of them to fall onto the floor in a thud. Can you get her? Jill suddenly yelled at me. I shook myself awake. Oh, what? She tosses me long black zip ties. Get her hands and feet. I picked up the zip ties and my hands shook as I bound Guadalupe's wrists together. We need to call the police, I told her. They need to know what's going on. I, I agree, she holds up her cell phone. Except I can't get a signal out here. Can you? I looked down on my own phone and saw the no service warning in the corner. Jill finished tying Robert up and then propped him up against the fridge. Where did you learn how to do that? I asked her. What, the zip ties? Never leave home without them. No, the choking thing. Oh, she smiled. My dad owns a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym out in SoCal. She comes over and sits Guadalupe up and peels back an eyelid. In concussion, she told me. She slaps Guadalupe in the face. If she falls asleep, she might not wake up. Guadalupe eventually came around, but her speech was slurred. We gave her some water and then decided to move her closer to the couch. I could feel a pair of eyes on my back. The intensity causes me to whirl around, coming face to face with Robert, who was wide awake and staring daggers into me. His facial expressions are motionless, as he sat there in silence while ungagged. He wasn't going to be out for long, Jill said. Hey, she snapped her fingers at my face. What do we say we try to get those locked doors open? H how? Oh, brute force, Jill replied. Come on. When we got to the locked door in Irene's room, Jill took a deep breath and kicked it down the center. The bells on the wreath rung from the forest, but the door didn't budge. There's probably three inch screws in the wall studs, I told her. It was popularized a few years ago. I tapped the door. It's going to be nearly impossible to break down from here. I felt the edges, but I bet you they forgot to do the same thing to the hinges. Jill looked at me and smiled before pulling back her leg and kicking into the side of the door. It came loose from a crunching blow. We looked through the crack. Inside was a single fold-out desk and a chair. On the desk was a monitor that flicked on and off. Can you? Jill didn't need further convincing as she gave another kick, and the door mostly came apart. I moved the mouse on the desk and the screen came alive. Each part of the monitor was sectioned off into different parts of the house. In one of the panels, two figures were moving. It took me a second to realize that it was us. The video feed was showing our backs and I whirled around, staring into the dark room. They were watching us, Jill whispered. This entire time this place was bugged. I followed our images on the screen until I came to one of the picture frames hanging on the wall. My fingers brushed the edges until I noticed them cover the video feed in the closet. I moved my hand over the area again until I pinpointed the camera. It was in the center of one of those black screws holding up the picture. I would never have known it was there. Marcus's voice rang in my head. You have to be more diligent. I've got the Wi-Fi up, Jill told me. I turned around, still trying to make sense of everything. Where's the culprit? I asked. Hmm? Someone had to be sitting there. I pointed to the chair. Look, we should probably go tell the others. She nodded. They have a right to know. We could probably even untie Robert now. I added. Maybe, Jill said grimly. But after what I just did, he could prove to be more violent towards me if we let him go. It's one of the harsh realities when taking down a bigger opponent and not finishing them. They'll always pose a danger afterwards. We made our way out of the room and down the hall towards the kitchen. I winced as I heard the fire crackling as we drew closer. Hey, we managed to open the lock. There was no one there. Both Robert and Guadalupe were missing. We heard a clamor come from below and ran towards the window. Two figures trailing across the snow. They had come out of the garage. One of them was being dragged. Oh, crap, it's them, 
Joe whispered. We've got to do something. They probably still think that one of them did it. We ran down the stairs and opened the front door. The ice bit into my fingers as we dug our way out. The cold cut like a knife into my flesh. The tip plucking a wage tendon, pushing aside a vein as it split the connecting tissue with each stroke as I plunged my hands into the snow clearing a path. Jesus, Jill yelled into the wind. It's freezing. She cupped her hands. Guadalupe, Robert. But it was no use. Her words were thrown to the wayside by the wind. I think I see them. I pointed across the road, uh, next to the light post. Before I could stop her, Joe ran out the door and she got as far as at the end of the driveway before stumbling onto the ice. The wind blew my ear numb so I couldn't hear her fall. But the image of her pinned to the ground told me that she was in trouble. Come back, I yelled. There's no way you're going to reach them. I didn't know if she could hear me, but she started to stand up. I saw her turn and look at me, and that was when the snow moved. It crawled. The snow top rolled like tiny little legs, almost as if an ice sheet were gliding. Chill, I screamed. Come back. She waved her arm at me, and then she was flat. The snow covered her quickly, crawling over her body, reaching around her throat in order to fill her mouth as the wind howled into the night. I froze in terror as I watched her being carried away, buried alive in the snow. I screamed and screamed and found my legs as the wind battered me from all sides, but it was no use. She was taken. In the back of my mind, I knew what had taken her, even if they were significantly smaller. I knew how they moved and I had seen it before her. Rolling over the surface, crushing everything in its path, searching blindly in the dark with the pitter-patter stick of its tendrils. I could finally see it now, in the snowflakes licking my outstretched hand and landing on my face. They came falling from the sky, so tiny like that camera. I wouldn't have ever noticed it if it wasn't shown. I pulled my hand closer and watched as the tiny translucent tapeworms mixed with the snow and began to stir in my skin, cracking their icy shells, uncurling their bodies as the heat from my arm woke them from their slumber. I could have brushed them off, but I already knew that it was too late. I looked up at the sky and watched them falling down like stars all around me. Nearly frozen, I stumbled my way back to the cabin. I flung open the door and shut it behind me. I had only closed my eyes for a second when I felt the glass thump against my neck. I turned and came face to face with Guadalupe who stood on the other side of the window. She was smiling and her teeth were chattering. Let me in, she said as her hands banged in the glass again. Her sleeve and near tatters when I opened the door. She came in with the snow. Well, thank God, she told me as we pushed the door closed. I began rubbing her arms as if they were an icy blue. We have to get next to the fire, I told her. She nodded as we made our way up the stairs. Where did you go? What happened to Robert? I asked. He dragged me outside, she claimed. Pulled me by my hair and said something about not wanting to sleep under the same roof as a dang killer. I couldn't stop him. But then the wind and snow. Everything blowing so hard. I found a chance to push him when he was trying to throw me over an ice patch. He hit his head on a rock. And I would have just left him. But that guy kept pulling on my arms. Ripped my sleeves near off. She showed them to me and suddenly I felt frozen. Suddenly I felt as if I should have turned around the moment that I saw the roadblock on the mountain pass. So I stepped on his balls. Guadalupe kept saying. Felt one of them squish beneath my feet. I tell you that. Oh man, did he wail. I could even hear him above the wind. She kept rubbing her arms. We have to make it past this night, yeah. I'm sure they'll come for us in the morning. She stretched out her arms to welcome me close. What's wrong? Hey, where's Jill? I was still staring at the tattoo on her arm when I realized too quickly to look away. She was taken by the snow. What? She slept, and the wind carried her off. I couldn't get to her. You left her out there. I nodded as the light flickered on and off across our bodies, reading the tattoo on her arm over and over again in my head. 
coexistence. I worked as a lifeguard for the local water park in San Antonio ever since I was 16. That didn't change when I went off to college. I would come home during the summer session and I would work there too. But then in 2020, the park didn't open. I went through an entire school year low on cash, splitting the meager stimulus checks over the coming months. And in 2021, the park was still closed. By now, I was desperate for a job and started looking through all of the listings that I could find. Indeed, a jobs, a Craigslist, a Facebook. But it wouldn't be until I bought the local gazette that I found my calling. It was in small print, requesting experience around bodies of water. Deep water. There was a phone number attached and not much else. I gave it a call and got an address. The old man on the line didn't seem too concerned with my credentials. He was more interested if I could make the hours. It would be every single day from 9am to 5. There ain't gonna be no sick days or nothing. No vacation, nothing. If you take on this job and you're 15 minutes late, I invited somebody to replace you. There will be no negotiations, no second chances, and absolutely no loitering. Once it's five, you pack it up and go home. Being broke, I couldn't get out of my motorcycle fast enough. I rode out to the sticks and found myself in miles and miles of farmland. There wasn't even a cow or an electric post in sight. I eventually arrived at a shed near the main road, and the old man was there to greet me. He was perhaps 60 years old, had on blue jean overalls and a white shirt. He also slung a shotgun over his shoulder. He didn't say much, just asked me to follow. At first, I kept looking back, afraid someone would steal my bike. But as we kept walking, I started to grow concerned for my own safety. Flashes of old yeller began to creep onto the back of my neck as I watched the barrel of his gun bob up and down as he walked. And then it dawned on me. I hadn't told a single person where I was going. Here's the hole, he suddenly said. I was so distracted that if he hadn't have said anything, I probably would have fallen into it. I looked down and realized that I had never seen water like this before. It was clear, but the bottom looked black. I could feel the sun banging on my shoulder, but still, the water looked black. And it wasn't really much of a hole, more like a small pond. It looked to be about 20 feet in length and there was nothing inside of it. No signs of wildlife or brushes. There was no algae or even leaves on top. Anyone who has owned even a small inflatable pool would have been baffled by the cleanliness of it. It looked clean enough to drink out of. Yet for some reason, I felt as if I drank this water, it would never stop. It would go down my mouth and into my stomach and just to keep going and going. I peered over the edge, trying to get a better look. The water started about a foot below the soil. The blades of grass were peeled away from it, and the surface was completely still. How deep is this thing? The old man shrugged. We're gonna fill it up in a couple of weeks when the boys get the cat out here, but for now it's a liability issue. I've been sighted by those gosh dang leeches on the board saying that he needs at least eight man-hours of surveillance per day on top of all else. That's why you're here. He nodded toward the trail cameras set up in the trees. And I'll know if you don't show up, you hear. And with that, he was gone. And I was left to begin my first watch. In the first ten minutes, I came to the astounding conclusion that there was absolutely nothing to do. So I mostly sat down at a nearby tree and scrolled through my phone. At least there's connection out here. I said out loud to no one, and for no one. It wouldn't be two or three hours in before I grew tired of uh, looking at my phone, and I slightly dozed off. I had been sleeping for a while when I started feeling myself falling. 
I screamed in my dream as my legs kept kicking at the ground. I flapped my arms but still I kept on falling. I could feel the rush of the void below as I kept sinking, and then I felt something wet which instantly woke me up. I opened my eyes facing the sky. I was on my back and my arms were above my shoulders as if I had been dragged through the grass. I looked down on my feet and saw that they were in the water. I quickly got up and backed away. I looked behind me to where I had been sleeping under the tree, except for now I was about 15 feet from it. Must be a low point in the soil, I reasoned. That's why all the water had gathered here. This entire area must be dipped toward the hole. I'd have to be more careful in the future. A few hours later, the alarm on my watch would beep at 5 o'clock, and I would walk back to my motorcycle and go home. At dinner, I told my mom everything, where I was, who I was with, and the number that they could be reached at, and the address that I'd been given. I even told her about the hole, but she didn't seem to be too concerned. The sinkholes are common in this area, she told me. Oh, wetlands, erosion, she rattled off. For the next couple of days, I kept going back to the hole and admittedly, I fell asleep more than once but I was always sure to not sleep too close to it again. It didn't take more than a week before sheer boredom and curiosity finally got the better of me and I started walking around the rim of the hole. I shined the flashlight from my phone into it. Mine didn't even get back a reflection. This thing had to be pretty deep I figured. How deep was it though? I found a broken branch nearby and dragged it over, poking it into the water. It had gone down about five or six feet when I realized that I was starting to feel some resistance. It felt as if it were near the bottom, so I leaned more weight into it. Big mistake. The resistance gave and I fell in. I plunged through the surface. My body instantly started shaking. The water is freezing. It felt like a sledgehammer was taken to my chest as I convulsed. My arms stiffened at my sides. I couldn't swim. I couldn't swim. The muscles on my left leg contracted. I could feel the sinew rippling underneath my skin as it cramped up. It wouldn't extend in, so I began to sink. Everything was black, and I couldn't tell if I was right side up or not. I started to panic and tried to spit out the bit of water that had gotten into my mouth, but because I was completely submerged, it caused me to swallow. It felt as if I were choking. I wanted to cough, but I couldn't. I kicked with my free leg and it felt like white noise. I kicked again, nothing. This thing was bottomless. I would sink and keep sinking and no one would ever find me. I would just keep going and going until I was snaked through the earth's crust, eventually falling into the pits of magma far below. The pressure was beginning to build on every side of me, pushing in my eyes against my skin and wrapped around my throat, squeezing me flat, squeezing me of all my air so that it may open my mouth and force its way in. There was nothing I could do. My lungs felt as if they were on fire. A part of me wanted to be quenched, but then I remembered a part of my training manual as a lifeguard. Loosen your limbs, spread yourself out like a star, it read. I pushed against my joints and stretched out my limbs by force, kicking when I could. Slowly, slowly I felt myself rising toward the surface. A noise came from below. It shook everything around me. I laid absolutely still as I listened. It sounded as if a thousand needles were being dropped onto the floor, their points hitting the concrete. I looked down below, staring into the absolute darkness. Not a single sign, and yet I could feel something coming. Terrified, I began to claw my way to the surface. Swim, 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 I yelled at myself. I could hear the needles getting closer to my ear. Swim. I threw my arms upwards and kicked with both of my legs, fighting my cramped leg, struggling against the water, and still it felt as if I were sinking. The needles grew into a roar and I could feel an immense pressure building beneath me. 
The water felt like bubbles swimming past me as I was blown out of the water. I was hurled through the air and landed several feet away. It sounded like a jet engine behind me, absolutely screaming as the water shot straight into the sky. For a second, I thought I was dreaming. I walked over to it and saw the droplets in the air. It looked like rain falling upwards. I held on my arm and touched it. Even the viscosity was different than that of tap water. I felt something crawling on my skin which caused me to recoil. On my hand was a translucent and jelly-like creature, the size of an eraser and completely flat. After I had exposed it to the air, it started to grow white. I watched as it contracted its body as it lunged toward, crawling on my arm. I peeled it off my skin and then threw it on the grass. It was so light, almost like air. And then it struck me. These things could be carried out for miles in the clouds. I've read about fish eggs and frogs that did that, so who knows where these things might land. I looked up in time to see the water had mostly stopped. A few droplets had begun to fall back down as normal. I looked into the hole and it looked completely empty. I couldn't see the water below or anything else. The hole simply kept going. The ground started to shake and again I could hear the sound of needles. I knew what was coming, so I ran as far as I could through the field. Three loud booms. The water shot upwards again and again like a cannon. I hadn't gotten very far when I saw the old man come driving down the field, his old sidestep pickup bouncing in the air as he came hurtling toward me. Get in the truck, I thought he yelled. Three more loud booms. I jump in through the window and he turns us around and drives us back toward the shed. When we get there, we are stopped by a group of men in suits. Black utility vehicles rumble past us, and the old man gets out and starts yelling at these men on his property. One of the suits pulls out a taser and the old man is shot in the chest. He goes down next to me. I try to pick him up, but the man in his suit yells at me to leave him. I'm up against the wall. Another man in black shouts at me. I feel my head being pushed against the shed. They cuff me and throw me into the back of the SUV. We're hurtling down the road, and in the rearview mirror I can still see the water shooting towards the sky, touching the clouds. I can still hear it launching into the air. I am taken to a secluded government building not too far away. I sit in a holding cell for about an hour when a man in a three-piece corduroy suit comes in. He explains to me that I had been tampering with a protected site on federal property. I try to protest, but he insists that it is within my best interest to not say a thing, to only listen. So, for the next hour, I listen to his explanation about phreatic volcanism, where water and magma interact. After I nod and agree a dozen more times, he tells me that I'm free to go. The next day, I see it on the news about a freak geyser that happened here in San Antonio. I click through the videos hoping someone else had witnessed what I had witnessed. But all I see are a bunch of videos of water spouting 10 or 12 feet into the air. It's nothing like what I saw. I figured I would squash this into the back of my mind, and I did for nearly a year. Until I heard about that girl, the one that gets stuck in the wood cabin, and I realized that I have to tell someone in case it happens to them too. I feel better now that it's all out in the open. Thanks. I tried to go to sleep, but Irene's dead eyes kept staring back at me. The light from the fire danced across her broken gaze. I wondered if she was awake when the killer had slit her throat. Did she burn their image into her brain as she died? Guadalupe must have noticed too because she placed her hands over the dead woman's eyes and closed them. If we had some half dollars, then she could rest. What? I asked numbly. Uh, coins on her eyelids for the fairy, Guadalupe said. So that she can pay the fare otherwise, she won't be able to rest. I nodded sleepily, 
The warmth from the fire baking my bones for they still remembered how cold I had been. Don't fall asleep. Marcus's voice came in my head. I looked across at Guadalupe as she was stoking the fire. She has a weapon. There is a weapon in her hands. Panic rose in my chest as my eyes darted around for a nearby object to arm myself with. My hands wrapped around a snow globe that had been on the table side. The weight felt good in my hands. The panic in my chest subsided, returning back to normal, beating warmly again as fatigue rolled over my body. I don't know when I had fallen asleep, but I forced my eyes open as I felt the first rays of the morning sun coming through the windows. Irene was staring directly at me. We had bonded her up and placed her into a corner. Both of us were too tired last night to move her any further. The light was low and when I looked outside, it was still snowing. How many millions of snowflakes in an hour? How many of them were not snowflakes? I looked over at Guadalupe who was resting against the couch. The mark on her face from where Robert had struck her had begun to bruise on her cheek. If she were the killer, I slowly got up. I don't know what I would do. I limped to the bathroom and I closed the door. In front of the mirror, I pulled down my pants to look at my wound. The bandage was caked with dry blood. The thick, yellowish green pus smelled rancid as I pulled back the pad. The adhesive on the edges pulled my skin along with it, causing the crusted wound to crack. I couldn't bear running water over it right now. So I cleaned it up as best I could and then opened a packet of antibiotic equipment and applied it gingerly to the area. I placed a new pad on it and then finally exhaled. I hadn't even noticed that I was holding my breath. When I had gathered myself, I limped back outside. Guadalupe was already in the kitchen. I looked at her for the first time in good lighting. Her skin had lost most of its color. The creases on her face were deeper than before and her right eye could barely open. We were two battered women. Bread? In her hand was a fresh slice. She looked up from the kitchen. The power is still surging. Can't get it to stay on for more than a few seconds. Perhaps we should plug our phones into the wall and let them get as much charge as we can. I nodded. Yeah, in case the trooper doesn't come back today. I went over to the corner where my charger had been and I turned off my phone, and then I plugged it in. I was about to walk away when it started turning on by itself again. The logo brandished itself on the screen as it booted back up. I waited until I was at the home screen before pressing the power shutoff buttons in unison. The screen went black again and the charging indicator had come on. It was a good thing that I had kept watching it. As the charging indicator disappeared, and then a few moments later, the logo came back on again. It's the power surge, Guadalupe said. I don't know when she had come behind me. I didn't even hear her footsteps. The phone loses power and the charging indicator goes away. And then when the power comes back on, it automatically boots back up. Crappy design if you ask me. I left my phone on and watched as the screen lit up and the phone vibrated. Less than a second later, it vibrates again. At this rate, the battery will be drained. Guadalupe agreed. We're going to have to keep our phones off. It's nearly nightfall and we've taken turns at trying to get a signal. The trooper hasn't come and there's not a snowplow in sight. The snow hasn't stopped and it keeps piling higher outside. It's my turn to check my messages and attempt a call to the outside. I can't get anything, so I guess I'll have to wait. Another day has passed and another morning gone by. There's food and water and not much else. Neither of us had said a word in quite some time. My phone is at 32%. I tried calling out again, but still nothing. Night has fallen. I woke up to the embers dying in the fireplace. I think that's the sound of wood splintering in the hearth that had woken me up. The thought alone sent shivers down my arms. I brush away at them as I lay on the sectional. 
I pull my blankets closer as I squeeze my eyes shut. And then I hear it again. I open my eyes slowly and strain my ears. It sounds like a jingle. I slowly crawl off the couch and walk quietly to the stairs. I look down into the darkness. I don't see anything. I could start to see wisps as I breathed. The embers cracked in the fireplace and I started to go down the stairs slowly. The cool, stiff boards are creaking as they flexed beneath my weight. My legs are numb as I reach the bottom. I blindly put my hands forward and feel my way into the dark, pressing my fingerprints against the night. I feel along the walls as I go down the hallway, my hands finding the door that leads into the garage. I open it and let it shut behind me. I pull on my phone and shine it into the empty spaces. Searching for the light, I finally find the switch and I flick it on. There's nothing at first, but then the lights flicker on, and then they turn off again. I hear the jingle. The light from my phone pans towards the noise, but it's too weak and the beam doesn't go half a foot. The lights in the corner flicker back on again. I get a glimpse of the door and I can see the wreath shaking. The balls and the little golden bells rolling back and forth as it touches the edges. The power goes out again. I walk closer with my phone, shining it onto the edges of the door frame, and I want to cry as I see that the door frame is wiggling. The worms. They look like hundreds of tiny little fingers squirming as they're trying to force their way out of the cracks, coming from the edges and beneath the door pushing over each other as they try to get free. And then suddenly they stop. The jingling stops and the door stops shaking as they turn towards me. Their tiny blind faces are following me as I backed up into a support beam. Don't move. I nod my head and watch as their tips twitch along ever so slightly. The light turns back on. They can sense heat. I hear Guadalupe say from behind me. It looks like they're trying to break out. She walks closer to the door and pulls a needle from her sleeve. I hear the door jingle as the lock comes free. The worms have followed her feet, crawling over her shoes like snow as she looks into the room. Inside is a padded cell. The DIA must have been using this as a holding room. I can see a body a heap of flesh balled into a mound in the center of the floor. It was the trooper. I guess he didn't make it past the gestation period. You killed him? Of course she killed him. Marcus screamed into my head. We needed a new host. We? Guadalupe turned to me and proceeds to unhinge her jaw, exposing the ridges in her throat and there in the center of her mouth is a pale pink larva looking creature in place of her tongue. I watched as its eyelids sickly open, revealing two beady eyes staring back at me. I can't even scream as I run towards the door. She crashes her body into mine and we tumble to the floor. I can feel my stitches opening up. Get off of me, I screamed. We need more hoes. Her voice echoes back as she lashes out and strikes me on the face. Lights pop in my head as I come reeling forward. She pins me to the ground. I can see from her hand that she's holding up one of the translucent worms from the door. The edges are growing white as if it is dying. She rips off the whitening flesh and I watch as they slowly start to grow back. Usually we only need an opening, even a wound will work, but if we want it to really stick, through the mouth is the fastest option. Oh, what are you doing? Good. Stall her. Oh, don't worry. It won't hurt much. We simply eat your tongue away until the ends and then attach ourselves to the muscle. She dangles it playfully above my mouth. Stall her. What are you? I cried. Her lips unfurl as she smiles. None of us really know. One day, my brothers and sisters just were. Some say we came from the sky, others say deep from the ocean. All I know is that we want to coexist alongside humans. You're a parasite, 
I spat as I struggled underneath her, but the points of her knees are pressed against my shoulder and ribcage. You won't think that once you become like us. Now shut up and open wide. All I can do is shake my head as she brings the thing closer to my face. Keep her talking. You killed Irene, didn't you? She was too old to be a host. We tried and she died. Oh God, Robert was right. We had to slit her throat to make it seem less suspicious. She nodded in agreement. I tried pushing my shoulder off the floor, but her knee pushed me down once again. But you're young and healthy. You'll make a good host. Maybe even become a queen. Her hand chokes my neck. I gag from the forest, my mouth opening as she starts to lower the creature in. I close my eyes, expecting to feel it ooze down my throat. But she pauses. I look up and see her staring curiously into my mouth. Brother? She peers closer. But you're nearly dead. She reaches down my throat and starts pulling at my tongue. Her hand recoils as she howls. Now! I push her off and run towards the door. I slam it behind me and lock it. Kill her! I run up the stairs and start pulling open the drawers. I can hear the door to the garage shaking as it is struck repeatedly. I'm looking for a weapon as the sounds of wood breaking come from below. It's pitch black as the fire has died out in the hearth. I can hear her running up the stairs. I turn to escape out the balcony but my head is suddenly pulled back. I push against her so fiercely that a chunk of my hair comes off in her hands. My hands search blindly in the dark, looking for something to use. My fingers wrap around a wrought iron poker. I swing it wildly in every direction. I feel the curved end connect with a sickening crunch as it lodges into the side of Guadalupe's head. She screams and keeps coming, clawing at my arms, pulling herself closer to my mouth. I yank the rod loose and a chunk of her head comes off. There's blood everywhere. She moves towards me again, her hands outstretched as she tumbles to the floor. I pull my arm back and I strike down again and again and again. And when I see that pink thing wriggling its way out of her mouth, I flatten it with the steel in my hands. I can hear the exoskeleton crunch. Day broke out into the living room. Irene's eyes were still open as she stared at us. I gathered a few things from the rooms, socks from Robert's bag, some clothes out of Jill's suitcase, and even some garments from Guadalupe's room. I packed some food and rope in my bag. The snow had stopped sometime in the night and the sun had come out, but I still couldn't get a clear signal. Before I left, I turned in the stove without lighting it letting the gas fill the house, and then placed a flickering candle in one of the rooms downstairs. I pushed my way through the front door and began walking back towards the hospital. The ice blanketed everything. I didn't know if I could make it, but a voice in my head kept telling me that I could. Sometime later, I hear an explosion in the distance. The fire was probably raging right now back at the cabin. I pulled my jacket closer. I kept walking, leaving most parts of the main road as I cut across the mountain. Each step was knee deep and difficult for me to clear. I could feel blood dripping down my leg, but eventually I came to the top of an adjacent mountain range just as the sun had begun to dip. I looked down at the alcove and saw the hospital and a few surrounding businesses at Mercy. I told you that I get it. I hear his voice faintly in my head. And then I felt something rigid in my mouth. It was dried and it felt solid. I took off Guadalupe's gloves and reached into my throat, nearly choking as my fingers searched for the foreign object. When my fingers touched it, I immediately knew what it was. I pulled it out from the back of my tongue and revealed what looked like half a cocoon. I noticed that the exoskeleton was peeling so I began to shed away the layers. Inside was half of a translucent worm. 
its body covered in slight yellow paws as the edges began to grow white. It seemed to turn and look at me before it finally stopped moving. I placed it gently on the snow and cried. Ever since then, I haven't been able to hear Marcus's voice. I wish that I could have thanked him. I wish he could have known how much I loved him. No matter what.